Welcome to Memories from the Sideline, through which the Ulster Schools GAA, with the support of sponsors Danska Bank, is charting the development of hurling and Gaelic football in schools in the province. Jimmy Smith continues the story. After the success of the history of the McCrory Cup written by Aidan Walsh, Ulster Schools are now embarking on the history of the McGain Cup with the author Seamus Magdalene. Seamus, when was the start of real competitions and hurling for the schools and us? Well, I always thought that the McGain Cup started in 1963-64 uh, season. And that's indeed when the McGain Cup was first presented. But there were competitions going for 12 years before that. So it actually started actual competitions at senior level started in 1952-53 season. And there was a senior shield competition that uh, senior shield was presented. The first winners were St. Malachy's College in 1952-53 season. And the senior shield continued to be presented up until beginning of 1963-64 when the McGeehan Cup was to be presented. McGeehan Cup itself, actual cup, was presented in the death of Bishop McGeehan presented by Drummondtown College outside Newry. And it was presented to the Ulster Colleges for the senior competition in Hurling. Seamus, what's the background to the presentation or non-presentation of the Winners' Trophy in 1963? St. Magnesis Garantar were the holders of the Senior Shield. They actually won the competition in 1963, in September, October 1963. There, were no, there was no cup to present to them. And the photograph that I have of the actual game has the uh, senior shield been represented. Obviously, they had it in the school and they brought it along with them. And it's presented to the captain there and the photograph is taken with the senior shield. The McGeehan Cup, however, appears later in that year. Uh, that was the first year that the Ulster School took part in the Croke Cup, the All-Ireland semi-final of the Croke Cup. Just prior to the All-Ireland semi-final, which was a game between St. Peter's Wexford and St. McNeese's Garantar, a photograph was taken in Garantar, and in that photograph is the McGeehan Cup, but also the Senior Shield. Isn't there evidence of a junior competition prior to 1952? I would say the capitalist for all hurling within Ulster Colleges was the establishment of the St. Magnesis Garantar in 1951. It was opened in 1951 as a second diocesan college in Down and Connor. Given the focus of Hurlan in Ulster being in the Down and Connor diocese, St. Malachy's and now St. Magnesis Garantar and St. Mary's Belfast were the three schools that were kind of the focus for Hurlan in those early years. St. Malachy's yearbooks prior to 1951-52. There is mention of hurling there every year. There's house competitions in hurling in the 1930s, 1940s, etc. And they're craving for Ulster Colleges to take on board and establish a hurling competition. But it doesn't seem to happen. You also made an interesting discovery hanging on a wall during your research in St Malachy's College. Can you tell us about that? Hanging on the wall was an ancient photograph of a St. Malachy's College hurling team 1904. No names on it, but it's obviously the hurling team that hurling sticks and two priests in the front row. So I inquired about this and I found out that uh, one of the priests was a Garage O'Neilline, who was an Irish teacher in St. Malachy's College at that Valley Garage O'Neilline. And he's the brother of, I think he might have been the vice president of Ulster Council when it was established in 1903. Um, and that was M.V. O'Nolan. He was a customs officer in Strabane. And he's the father of the Flan O'Brien, the novelist. And he was in St. Malachy's College at that time. And from what I can gather from uh, Irish news reports in early 1900s, St. Malachy's College seemed to have taken part in the South West Antrim League or in the in Belfast League of some description when the Antrim County Board was established. I think they were established in 1902, 1903. And uh, there are references to St. Malachy's uh, having taken part in hurling games in South Antrim at that particular time. And then maybe in about 1908, we have a reference to St. Malachy's restarting hurling and re-entering the 
the Belfast League in hurling. Seamus, what about the huge involvement of the Christian Brothers in hurling? Christian Brothers would have had a long established tradition of bringing hurling from wherever they came from, up to Ulster and establishing it in the schools that they were in. So you had in the 1927, I think, was St Mary CBS was established in, the, in Barrack Street in Belfast. And there was an immediate interest in establishing hurling there. You also had, if I could maybe even quote from an interesting letter that I came across, in 1928, when Ulster College's Council was first established, uh, there was a letter from the Christian Brothers, Brow of the Hill School in Derry. Congratulations on your effort to bring our national games into uh, their own in Ulster. I cannot possibly get to our ma for this meeting, but I shall cooperate in every way with you. Our boys here do not play and are not allowed to play anything but Gaelic games preferably hurling, and hurling is underlined. I can say that I have but little faith in football in Derry. The soccer craze is too great, but I have great faith in the power of hurling to attract our boys to the GEA. And that was kind of the attitude of these Christian brothers at that particular time. And you have the Abbey CBS in Uri, for example, representing down in minor hurling and Crow Park. Uh, 1930, 1932, 1934. They're playing against teams like Kilkenny and I think uh, one year it was Leash. They played in All-Ireland semi-finals representing Ulster. They'd beaten Antrim, they beaten Armagh, etc. And they were coming from the Abbey School in Uri. There was no other hurling going on in Down and very little underage activity, I suppose, in Down at all in her. So the Abbey was represented. Then you had Armagh CBS. It was a tradition of hurling there from time to time. Yeah, that St. Michael's Enniskill had a team briefly in the early 1930s as well. But there was no coordinated effort to establish these. And the only coordinated effort seems to come from St. Mary's Belfast, who tried to establish a kind of a East Coast hurling league involving Abbey CBS, Dundalk CBS and Drogheda CBS. And that would have been in the early 1930s, maybe 1932, 33. And from that there, St Mary's actually joined the Leinster College's Hurling League at one stage. So there's plenty of activity going on in different places, but very, very uncoordinated. And Ulster College's Council doesn't seem to be able to take kind of control of it and establish leagues as such. In it. You talked about the Christian Brothers and you've talked about some CBS, and when you bring them again into the, that picture, you see that some actually dominated from 64 to 77. I think they won 13 in a row, isn't that right? Ulster colleges tended to leave it to the schools that wanted to play hurling to organise games themselves. The Cup was there, or the Shield in the early days was there, but the two schools that you're talking about there, St Magnesis College and St Malachy's College, were very strong. Football tended to be played by the Borders, and hurling by the day pupils in Garantar. In St Malachy's, you had hurlers from around Belfast and also from, say, the Ards Peninsula, etc. But they lost a lot of the North Antrim hurlers to Garantar. So St Malachy's sort of were there at the beginning, but they faded out fairly sharply after that. St Mary's shared that 1955 title with Garantar simply because the match was played in May and a playoff was needed because it was run on a league basis. The three teams played each other and St Mary's and Garantar drew in an early game but then they were supposed to have a playoff and it was too close to the exams it never happened. So it was shared. Actually, there was another one shared but for a completely different reason. 1958-59 season, the game between them was supposed to happen on the 10th of October in 1958. Alas, the Pope Pius XII died on the 9th of October, the game had been postponed. Two diocesan colleges couldn't possibly be playing Gaelic games or any sort of games during a, a period of mourning. So we ended up with that they couldn't find another date the whole year to play that game and the competition was shared. But your question was St Mary's. St Mary's came into their own around about 1964 and from 1964 up until uh, 1977, they won 13 in a row. Cross and Passion Ballet Castle came in and won two in a row and then three more in a row for St Mary's Belfast. So in many of those years, St Mary's really had very little opposition. They were winning fairly handily. 
and St. Magnesius was declining as a school and, and as numbers, they hadn't got the numbers really in the 1960s and 1970s. Occasionally they would mount a challenge, but with the opening of day school in Ballycastle, they lost Ballycastle guys and Cross and Passion then took in boys. St. Louis Ballymena took in boys. So St. Magnesi's pool of players was decreased in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And you had other schools rising, but they had they hadn't got the numbers to compete with St. Mary's Belfast. The school that I attended, St. Patrick's down Patrick, or as it's referred to constantly in these reports, De La Salle down Patrick, occasionally would, would have a number of Hurden players there, and occasionally they would cause a shock by beating either St. Magnesis or indeed St. Mary's, to beat St. Mary's in 1969-70. But it ended up that there had to be a playoff there because St. Magnesis beat them. They never beat, beat the two teams in one year, but sometimes they beat one. Down Patrick had a well-known figure in Down GA coaching them. Tell us about him. The teacher that was in charge at the beginning in 1951, 52, 53 was Morris Hayes, who became the Down County Secretary. And of course, we know his uh, contribution to public life as well uh, in the years that followed. But for the first three years, he was the teacher promoting Hurling in the, uh, St. Patrick's and Down Patrick. Indeed, he had played Hurling in St. Patrick's and Down Patrick at an earlier stage in the 1930s. Let's move the story on to talk about St Mary's dominance during that time. The first three or four years, they were in the Croke Cup semi-final. But it became obvious by 1968 that Ulster teams were not competing in very well in the Croke Cup. And there was a, there was a All-Ireland B competition, the O'Keefe Cup, uh, named after Padraig O'Keefe, who was the uh, GA General Secretary for a number of years. And it was established in 1968, and uh, St Mary's CBS reached the final of it in the first year, but were beaten in that. They reached the final again in the 70-71 season. This time they won it. Now, as well as that there, they won the Hogan Cup that year. That was the first All-Ireland success. They won again in 1973-74 season when Paddy Mallon was the captain. Mickey Darrow would have been involved in that as well. But there was no more All-Ireland success from 1974 up until 2006. The only two O'Keefe Cups that came to Ulster came in in, in the 1970s, within a short period of time. And then Mahara broke the kind of glass ceiling again in 2006, and we had six titles in 10 years then, six All-Ireland titles in 10 years. Was that due to the strength of Mahara? In the 2000s. Yeah. They've been, like Ulster teams have been knocking on the door for a number of years. For example, the first Mahara team to win the All or to win the um, McGeehan Cup was in 1983. Uh, they entered the McGeehan for the very first time in 1982 and, and were runners up to, interestingly enough, Armagh CBS, who won their only title in 1982. The 80s were kind of change in. Uh, focus in Ulster Colleges. Mahara came through in 83 and of the Mahara team that won the uh, first McGee and Cup, it was captained by Johnny McGurk. Uh, he also had on that team uh, guys such as Enda Gormley. Damien Casty scored three goals and three points in the McGee and final of 83 uh, and you had the Downey brothers, Henry Downey and Shimas Downey. Those five, ten years later, were all Ireland winners with Derry footballers. That year they went on to All Ireland, but you'll be aware of this from the McCrory scenario that for a number of years during the 1970s and 1980s, right up until I think mid 90s, there was an age difference between the Ulster Colleges competitions and the All Ireland Colleges competitions. So you really had to recalibrate your team for the O'Keefe Cup. And that probably didn't do any favours to the Ulster champions either. That first year, for example, uh, Mahara lost, I think it was seven players ahead of the All-Ireland semi-final. But they brought in other guys. And one of the boys that they brought in was Danny Quinn, the Derry footballer. You mentioned Morris Hayes, for example, and you, you've mentioned various teachers. And you're, you're too bashful to intrude yourself in that. But your, your input into Mahara... And now, in, in latter days, Paul Hughes just shows the importance 
that a teacher, and especially a teacher who's interested in hurling, has on the success of a school? I would say that uh, the, there definitely is an element of truth in that there. If you go back to St Mary CBS, Christian Brothers had a big impact during the 1950s, 1960s on St, uh, St Mary CBS, right through the 70s. Brother Ennis, for example, was involved with Armagh CBS when they won it. Uh, and he'd also been involved in, in Belfast as well in promoting her. Joe McGurk, I would have said, was a catalyst for what happened in Mahara, although Patsy Quigg kept hurling going. Patsy Quigg taught Joe, and he, uh, Joe went through Mahara as a pupil, I think, and only played one hurling game that he can remember of. But Patsy was interested in hurling and kept entering them in things. And uh, But eventually Joe came back as a uh, teacher into uh, Mahara and his younger brothers were coming through the school at that stage Collie McGurk, Johnny, Paddy and then Kieran was the youngest those youngsters were coming through in underage but there had been an underage development going on in the clubs in Lavi at the same time Joe was involved in that too of course but Mahara then started to have stronger players coming through and that was one of the reasons that you know, they, they came through very strongly around the beginning of the 1980s was the development work been done in the likes of Lavi. Dungiven always had it. And I suppose there were more people coming over the hill from Dungiven into uh, Mahara at that particular time. And you always had a few other boys from other clubs that were useful as well, you know. Yeah. Now, the whole point of this, as I said at the start, is that you're, you're very graciously, I use that word very carefully, you're very graciously <laughs> agreed to write a history of <laughs> Now, hey, yeah, I know that you've done a lot of research, but when the book comes out, the last thing that you want to hear is somebody ringing you up and saying, I had a great photograph that would have looked well in that book of yours. So part of this story today is actually you asking the question, if there's anything out there, can you please have it? Most definitely. I, um, I was involved a number of years ago in doing a club history in um, my club in Leitrim and County Down, 1988 was the centenary of it. And uh, after we published the book, people came to us and said, I have a great photograph that would have been useful for that. I have this, that or the other. I have a newspaper cutting from 1935 uh, that, you know, you don't seem to have known about it. That's one of the problems of doing research is you can only research so much until people come and tell you that they have some... With social media now at the moment, I put up a few photographs on social media sites, Facebook sites for Garantar, for example. And in one case, I got a far better copy of the photograph within two hours from somebody else. Uh, I was putting the photograph up to get names of it, names of the players in it. And it's very helpful that way. Social media is very helpful at the moment. But as you say, Jimmy, you need people to contact me and with their information if you played hurling at all at any stage I want to talk to you because I don't know whether I have enough information or not enough have you a paper cutting from your McGee and Cup final or All-Ireland semi-final or you know your parents probably kept it there's a lot of mummies have kept scrapbooks there through the years and that's where you'll find you know the most of the information is kept Young fellas that are playing in school aren't interested in keeping mementos of that description, but it's their parents that keep it, you know, and those those are the things that I'm looking for. We're relying on the older generation once again, James. Yep, very dependent upon them, you know. And any a lot of my format would be that I will try and cover the what happened during the course of 1970, for example, during the course of the competition and bring it through to the All Ireland semi final. And then I'm looking for the captain to give me uh, some of his personal memories of that particular year. So maybe give a, a page over to the captain. And what you're getting of the captain is completely different than what you would get from a newspaper cutting because you're finding out in many cases, or most cases that I've done there, they give you a very, very detailed insight, personal insight of what was going on in the school, what was going on in the team during that particular year. Some of it was great fun. For example, uh, uh, I contacted P.J. McCampbell. Philip J. McCampbell is, is a priest who spent most of his life out in Africa in the missions. He's in Nairobi at the moment. So I contacted him by email 
and he was able to give me a great rundown of his turn as captain of St. Magnesius Guarantar. He talked about uh, the final, he talked about uh, coming home through the gates of Garantar and there's a huge bonfire at the gates of Garantar waiting for them coming back into the school and then he was carried up to the president's office and, uh, and uh, had to ask for the evening off study uh, the next evening as a reward for winning. But he also tells small anecdotes as well, like for example, he played in one game uh, against St. Malik's Belfast and I in fact found a uh, Match report of that game, it ended in a draw 3-12 to 5-6, and PJ scored 11 points in it. So no wonder the following happened. But uh, he claims that as he went to pick up a ball along the sideline, he clearly heard the priest from the other side shout something at him. Now, this is pre-helmets. You didn't wear helmets in those days. And PJ also suffered from bad eyesight, so he had to wear glasses when he was playing. He tied the glasses on. Now, he heard the priest along the sideline shout at one of the boys, smash that man's glasses. So, uh, you know, those are personal things that I want to hear from people, you know, that I want, I want to hear the stories as well as the reports of act, actually what happened. Uh, those stories tell more about what's going on in the game than anything. <laughs>